thank you all. It's really a pleasure to be with you. Um, you know, every time I'm with my Hadassah family, I'm reminded I cannot be a member, uh, but I'm more than an associate. I'm really a, a, a lifelong family member. And uh, I was with you when you were marching uh, in, in the 70s. Uh, I was with you when we had uh, Natan's name uh, on our bracelets uh, and in our hearts. And uh, all that you have given me, uh, women of Hadassah, the heroines of Hadassah, the role models of Hadassah over the years, uh, it started with you know the privilege to work with people like Ruth Popkin and Charlotte Jacobson, and then the next generation, uh, Marlene Post, and now uh, so many of you. Uh, I've worked with you in Israel. Actually, my first Hadassah convention was in 1979. I was five. Um, and um, no, I'm joking. Uh, but uh, I, it was 1979. I was fresh back from my year course. And it's quite remarkable because I was starting my journey as a lucky American Jew on my way to college. And I'm now so aware that uh, Natan was already deep in what ended up being his nine year um, ordeal in the Gulag. And the extraordinary thing uh, about Natan, as Judy said, is not only that sense of humor, but that indomitable spirit. And uh, it's really been uh, the, the great privilege of my life to uh, work with him for the last three years and to uh, finally know that as of August, we'll have hard copies of the book and as of September, it'll be officially launched. And uh, just let me wait, say one thing about the, um, the title and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll start the conversation. So the working title, and we literally signed a, uh, a contract, was 999, because Natan had this way of saying, I was nine years in Gulag, nine years in Israeli politics, and nine years in Jewish agency, and I don't know where I suffered most. And uh, the problem with 999 as a title is, first of all, you can't have an inside joke as a title. And the second problem is I worried, because we want to not only speak to the Jewish community, but to our our non-Jewish friends and some of our Christian evang evangelical friends here in 999 think 666, the devil, not a good thing in this age of very sensitive uh, relations sometimes. So I'm sitting in Los Angeles with my friend David Suisa and I say, we need a title. And he says, well, tell me about the book. And I start telling some of the stories, especially the moments that we'll get to when Natan is alone in the, uh, in the gulag and the KGB is saying, you're forgotten you're abandoned. But he knows, even though he rarely finds photographic proof, he knows that you're marching with him, that I'm marching with him, that his amazing wife, Abital, is mobilizing uh, forces. And even though he's in this information vacuum, he knows he's never alone. And David in interrupts me and goes, that's it. For 75 years, we've been obsessed with never again. And of course, we have to remember, uh, we have to preserve the memory of the Shoah. But um, what did I learn in Young Judea? What have I learned from Hadassah? What have I learned indeed, and I'm happy you use that word again and again, Judy, as a Zionist, that when you're a part of this extraordinary family called the Jewish people, you're never alone. And I lived it in the most spoiled way possible as a member of Young Judea, studying, becoming a professor, making Aliyah. Uh, Natan has really paid a much higher price, and that's part of the, the, the creative tension uh, in working with him. And now it's really my uh, honor and my privilege to turn it over to uh, Natan or, or bring him into the conversation. And uh, among his many, many uh, awards, and he's going to be getting the Genesis Prize uh, this year, and he got the Israel Prize two years ago, but he also is the 1987 winner of the Henrietta Zold Award. And Natan, it's 1987, you're fresh out of nine years of the gulag, of decades in this vacuum called the Soviet Union, and you get this award now. We know Eleanor Roosevelt got it, David Ben-Gurion got it, Abba Eben got it. What do you know about this organization called Hadassah? Well, uh, uh, hello everybody, glad to be with you. Uh, thank you, Gil. Uh, in fact, I was very well prepared for my meeting with Hadassah because first time I heard about Hadassah was in prison, in my first month in prison during investigations in KGB Leforto prison, there I was, during all this year and a half in prison, I was, all the time I had one cellmate, definitely the one who KGB wanted me to be my cellmate. And this time it was some 
very high top of Soviet official who was arrested for bribes. And while we were uh, sharing the cell together, he was telling me many interesting stories from the life of the Soviet elite, from the, of ministers. He was a uh, deputy of one of those ministers. And uh, uh, at one moment he told me, you know, of course, there are not many Jews in the government. In fact, there was practically no Jew. There was always one Jew uh, for special reasons, for PR. But there are many of our ministers, including our prime minister uh, and our foreign minister, whose wives are Jewish. And you know, among us, the Greeks, he said, uh, there was a rumor which was much more than a rumor, that there is a secret Jewish organization. The aim of this organization is to marry Jewish women on the perspective of Soviet politicians. And then they don't let their husbands to drink. And they um, was giving them strategical advices. And that's how the Zionists are coming to influence on our government. And the name of this Jewish secret organization, and he whispered me, Hadassah. And that's the first time when I found out about Hadassah. So I knew about your Zionist aim to influence on the world, to, to promote our Zionist ideals. So I was very well prepared for my meeting with this wonderful organization. But can tell I also like Gugil, in all my years uh, of the government, the Jewish agency, we had so many projects together with, uh, with Hadassah and really you're, you're playing a very important pioneer role role in, in our match for the better future. And that influence continues both in uh, the extraordinary impact you have medically around the world and really waving that banner for Zionism. And it's so important, especially these days, that you continue to wave that banner. Uh, Natan, unfortunately, these days for too many people, including some members of the Jewish community, Zionism has turned into a dirty word. You are really one of the great human rights activists of the 20th and now 21st century. When people tell you, I can't be a Zionist if I'm a liberal, I can't be a Zionist if I'm a human rights activist, and now we're all aware of the article by Peter Beinart saying, I can't be a good liberal and still believe in a Jewish state. How do you answer that libel? Well, uh, uh, unfortunately, it's really the question which I was asked many times on the campuses in American universities for the last 20 something years, I was more than 100 universities. And very often I could hear from the young people, but we do want to work for the better of all the world. Tikkun Alam, isn't it our Jewish ideal? How you can be uh, working for the better of the world and at the same time to be connected to this narrow national agenda and all the time to be defender of the Zionist uh, state while there are so many things that I disagree. And I was always tell, taking them to our experience in the Soviet Union, because then I was the activist of two movements, of Zionist movement and human rights movement. And there also were voices from both sides that you have to choose, that you have to choose, are you working for the better of all the world or you are interested only in your the narrow national interest, your tribe. And I was always tell, taking them to our experience when we had no identity and no freedom of the Soviet Union, so we could not fight for anything because there were no values in our life except from physical survival. And it's only when I discovered, after 1967, I discovered that we have such unique history and I want to be part of it, that we have such unique Jewish family, and I want to be part of this family, and that we have a state which is ready to send airplanes to the end of the world and to help to every Jew in the world. That, when I discovered my identity, that would gain me strength to fight for me, for other Jews, and then for the rights of everybody. And as a member of Helsinki Group, we were fighting for so many numerous causes of Ukrainian priests, 
and uh, Catholics and uh, uh, Protestants and Crimea Muslims and uh, Armenian activists. So about many suffering people, but the strength to fight for their rights was coming only from the strength which you're getting from the energy which you're getting from your identity. And then you have values which are bigger than physical survival. So you're not afraid to take risks because you have this strength. And as to Bernard, it's, it's very unfortunate, by the way, this article of him, of Peter, that, uh, that enough with Israel as a Jewish state, we don't need it anymore. Now I see the future with the two states, uh, or with one state of all the people. And I can say, as to the influence on Israelis, I have, I'm sure it's a zero influence. How, how somebody can tell us there is a, a Jewish state is impossible. We are building every day this state. We are living in it. We are amazed how successful it is. And we know practically all Israelis, after all, they are all the first or the second, or the third generation of those who uh, lived with this idea with this dream and they know how powerful this idea is and finally they can build the state and it is so important that there is state with the law of return what means the state of all the citizens the state without law of return without special responsibility for the future of jewish communities and the jewish people so nobody in israel even can start taking it seriously but where it really brings some damage no in our efforts in the you uh, and i think all of our friends know very well how much efforts we have to uh, to put in bringing together Israeli society and uh, diaspora Jews. And how often we can see this uh, argument when you know, are they really interested in, uh, in the state of Israel or they are interested only to feel comfortable uh, about uh, with their neighbors. So they uh, are they really ready to support us as a Jewish state? Or they want something which will make them feel comfortable? And, that's, and of course we are arguing with this when we are saying it again, again and again how uh, Jewish people are really s strongly on the side of Israel. And then comes such article of Weinhardt and that gives a lot of fuel and a lot of energy to those who argue that so many liberal American Jews are not with us, are not with Israel, are not loyal, are not interested in Israel as the state of Jews. And that's, the, that's why it is very harmful. So your, your liberalism is actually a way into your Zionism, and your Zionism is a way into your liberalism. And yeah, well, I, I, I look, Zionism, uh, liberalism, without Zionism, without my national identity, is absolutely dec decadent. It, uh, it has no inner strength. It's all simply like uh, wishful thinking. Uh, you don't really have strength to fight for anything. While Zionism, without liberalism, is also is uh, very narrow. It's not the one which can appeal uh, to, to all the Jewish people. And it's not the one that we, uh, Jewish people, are interested in. So, uh, yes. Our Jewish state has to be Jewish and democratic at the same time. So Zionism is a movement that says, A, we are a people, not just a religion. B, like 190 other countries in the United Nations, we have the right to establish a Jewish state. And we have the right to establish a Jewish state on that homeland, on our homeland, Eretz Israel, on that land. And now we're also being told by some young rabbis that the Jewish people aren't indigenous to Israel. So peoplehood, okay, that's that can be kumbaya, I can work on it. Statehood, problematic, and now even our ties to the land are being questioned. How do you respond to the attack on our indigenous rights, our aboriginal rights to the land of Israel? Well, though it seems like a different argument, but it's the same argument, like, or, or at least my attitude to it is the same as to the argument of Weinhardt. What means that we don't have uh, the special connection? I know about this connection. I know uh, in my own life what it was when I discovered this connection and how powerful was this voice and how proud I was to join the thousand years of praise and, and dreams. And uh, 
we, we know about this connection from daily life. We know why hundreds of thousands of young Jews are coming to Israel and not to any uh, other place with their so-called birthrights in order to revive their feeling of Jewishness, their pr pride of belonging to Jewish people. They're coming to, to Israel for this, not to uh, Miami and not to, to Paris. Because uh, even when you're touching for a few moments this land of Israel, you immediately feel this deep, deep connection. And of course, all our history and all our archaeology and all our traditions and everything is about this connection. Now, when some rabbi, so-called rabbi, I would say, because uh, they, uh, this one who doesn't feel this connection with the uh, biblical land and, uh, and the people of the book, I don't know what he, that, what he learned as a rabbi, but when he says that uh, there is no such a connection, it means that it will be more comfortable to leave him without this feeling of double loyalty, without this uh, feeling of uh, uh, disengagement from American life, he will say, no, uh, the Jews don't have really special connection with the land of Israel. We American Jews have only special connection with, with the land where we live in. Because I, I, don't, I cannot find any other explanation why psychologically he decided to deny for himself the things which are so obvious, which are living in the hearts of all of us. Uh, my colleague from McGill University, uh, Erwin Kotler, and your lawyer, uh, has a great line about this. He says, the Jews are the original Aboriginal people. He says, you want indigenous people, right? Who's still connected to the same land 3,500 years later, reading from the same book, speaking the same language, praying from the same prayer books, and, and keeping the same culture alive? And it's an argument that we're somehow not succeeding in making with many of our young people, although I think we have a tendency sometimes, sometimes to exaggerate the, the extremists and give them too much of a voice and forget that most Americans, most American Jews, and most young Americans, most, most young American Jews remain very pro-Israel. You've, you've mentioned once or twice this, this revelation you had when you were young, um, where you discovered your identity and your freedom. When, when we started writing the book, and all the years that I marched in Solidarity Sunday and outside the Soviet embassies, and especially when we had 250,000 marching at that march in Washington, I just assumed that there were hundreds of thousands of refuseniks too. And I discovered you, I think you told me that, it, that, that the most number of refuseniks who ever signed a petition was 150. How do, you, how do you explain, first of all, what was the motivation? How did this very small band get excited? What, what made you guys stand out and stand up and say, I'm ready to fight for my freedom, I'm ready to fight for my Zionism. And, and how did you accomplish so much with such a very small army? Well, first of all, no doubt that after 1967, because, when, because of very different, uh, well, the obvious reasons, Israel entered in a very powerful way our life for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Soviet Jews who were absolutely assimilated like me. We had nothing Jewish in our life, no holidays, no tradition, no pa uh, Pesach, no Purim, no Brit Milan, no Bar Mitzvah, nothing Jewish except from antisemitism. And suddenly you rediscover your identity, and no doubt it brought back to their roots hundreds of thousands of Jews. But it was very dangerous to show it publicly. And so, uh, the beginning, there were only very few who were ready to risk their lives, but to get to Israel. And the first trials, Leningrad trial, and Kishinev trial, and Riga trial, and the 60s, it was about one dozen people. But the publicity around these trials reached many people like me, for example. And at the same time, the power of Jewish protest all over the world in support of the first prison of Zion was so strong that then it encourages hundreds, and then it encourages thousands. When I was activist in the beginning from 72, 73, there were about 3,000 refusers, those who dared to apply for visa and got refused. And at the same time, there were a few hundred active refusers who were ready 
to speak publicly, who were ready to sign letter, but because it was or protest, because it was difficult to collect the signatures, communicate between different cities. So I, you know, during my years of activism, and sometimes I was a spokesman of a movement, I was collecting the signatures, I never could succeed to, to send a letter abroad with more than 130 or 40 signatures, which was a lot. Usually it was five, ten people who are ready to, to, to protest public. But at the same time, the support we got, First of all, we did know that hundreds of thousands of Russian Jews, if not millions, think like us, but are afraid to express it. And that uh, those who are secretly asking to send them invitation to prepare themselves uh, for future we already in tens of thousands, but they were like secret uh, Zionists. And also we knew how powerful is the support of Jewish, Jews of the world. But suddenly, all these di different Jews from, from Miami, from San Francisco, from Paris, from Sydney, are coming and saying, your father is from Odessa, my father is from Odessa, we are family, we want to fight for you. And they are ready to take risk, and they uh, bring secretly materials for us to hide, uh, to, to uh, take secretly in their, their underwear uh, the documents, our documents, that to, to organize the huge demonstrations of solidarity abroad. That what was giving us strength. That was giving us this feeling that KGB can say you are only a bunch of students and housewives, and that's exactly what they're saying to me. Who is behind you? Bunch of students and housewives. But you felt that these are Jewish students and Jewish housewives and Jewish people as a whole, who are behind us, who are fighting for us, and those who are secretly with us. So we Jews who, who think like us, but waiting for the moment when they'll stop being afraid. And that's why our slogan, when I was working for a Washington demonstration, was there are 400,000 Jews who will come the moment the wall is brought down. Let's there be 400,000 Jews going on demonstration in Washington. And then some people were saying, what 400,000? There are officially, by documents, maximum maybe 3,000 refuseniks and maybe 30,000 potential people who want to leave. We were sure that we are speaking about hundreds of thousands and millions. And really, as you know, that's what happened. It's actually quite amazing. We in the United States of America were so sure the United, that, that the USSR, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, was so strong. And you from the inside understood that it was kind of like this, this overgrown giant, but the, the bee sting could actually uh, hit it in the right way and give the venom and kill it. And you had the optimism, we had the pessimism. We thought that this was just going to be a, a, a worldwide struggle that would never end. Um, you had a secret ally, though, in your struggle. Uh, two weeks ago, I was walking by your house on Shabbat, and um, you were in your ping pong stadium with some of your grandchildren, and you were having a Chagiga celebration because it was your 46th wedding anniversary. Um, tell us a little bit about Avital's role in this struggle and, um, and, and how you celebrated that anniversary. Well, uh, first of all, we, we, I believe you found the right way for the strong marriage. Unfortunately, when Sometimes we hear about some of our friends who after many years of marriage and uh, grow, uh, bringing people, children to this world and growing together, now then the sudden I divorce. And I say to them, why you're doing it in the wrong order? We, with Avital, got married, had our chupa. Next year, day she went to Israel. It happened so that we thought that we'll be together in a few months. We, we were separated for 12 years, and so then we uh, are living happily all the time. But of course, when I took to the airport, uh, Natasha, then uh, my, uh, my wife immediately after the wedding, uh, she was a very shy uh, girl who spoke a few words in Hebrew, no English, and that's all. When I met her 12 years after this, she was maybe as shy as before, but she was already the leader of hundreds of thousands of Jews. She opened the doors of practically 
every president, every prime minister, and even many kings in this uh, world. And she, of course, worked very closely with all the Jewish organizations, including, of course, uh, Hadassah. And the secret is that thanks God, very early in her coming to Israel, and she was immediately from the first moment that she came to Israel, she felt that is her home. Very quickly, she was explained by some uh, uh, by some outstanding rabbis, uh, and she was coming closer and closer to the religion. That that's that in gathering of exiles. That's great historical process that Kadosh Baruch Hu guarantees us that we all will come to Israel one day, but we have to fight for this for every Jew, and sooner or later, if we'll fight, every Jew will come to Israel. And she was fighting all these years with full belief that next day can be the day of my release. And I remember how later. Uh, uh, Prime Minister of France, Mitterrand, when I first met him, told me, you know, in this chair many times was your wife, Avital. And she always asked to help, and I never could say her, no, I always help. But I never believed to, I said, this poor, poor young woman, what she hopes for, the Soviet Union, how, how you can move it. How, I didn't believe that she can be successful. And I have to tell you, said Mitterrand, that she was right and I was wrong. So he had the courage to say what many politicians are not right to say. She, like we, the Soviet Union dissidents and Jewish activists, uh, we understood how the Soviet Union is weak from inside, that it's spending all its energy to he keep 200 million lives and brains under their control. And, and, uh, and how, in fact, uh, rotten is this system? But, but it's also how it is important to pray this system. When, when the, uh, Avital appealed directly to President Reagan, suddenly she saw real kindred spirit, who said, well, that's evil empire. How dare they to keep their people in uh, prison? They are doomed, and they will help your husband to get out of prison. Well, not exactly in this world, but that's what later he wrote, wrote also. His diary. And the same she saw uh, when she was speaking to Margaret Thatcher and to many other leaders who were really happy to help because they believed here that here is great mission of liberation of Jewish people, which is part of the great uh, uh, confrontation between the good and evil. And of course, the fact that uh, all the Jews were united in this struggle, from left to right. And Avital really had a unique experience of cooperating very closely with French communists and with uh, leading uh, rabbis in America, and practically with every other group uh, in the Jewish world. And, uh, and that's something which uh, really brought to this great victory. So 46 years of marriage, minus 12, because three years you were an activist and she was in, in, uh, in Israel, and then nine years in the Gulag. Um, all of us uh, should have been together in person, but we're all separated. Uh, we feel a sense of family, we feel a sense of connectedness, but we've all had intense feelings of isolation and an experience of being alone. Um, and uh, people have been asking you for advice. You survived nine years alone. Um, what's some of the advice that you've given that has been most successful, that's helped people cope, cope with this very, very difficult situation, uh, which would be a very different situation, because here the government is telling us when it does, stay inside for your own sake, as opposed to you being forced, uh, cut off from your family, cut off from your loved ones, cut off from your people by an oppressive government. Well, in fact, though it seems like a very different situation, of course, my isolation and the isolation in which we all find ourselves uh, in this uh, corona crisis, but there are some things which are useful to remember. First of all, it's very important to remember that you are a soldier in some bigger struggle. It could be very difficult to survive in these nine years and not to give up to the pressure of KGB if you don't feel that by saying no to KGB, you're fulfilling the 
important mission of soldier in the big historic struggle. And so here, following the instructions, we, each of us, in fact, is fighting this un unseen uh, enemy of coronavirus. The second, you, you should never feel yourself dependent on things which don't depend on you. I, I understood very quickly that if they will force me to think how I will survive, they will win. Because my survival is not in my hands. It's in their hands. So I told to myself, but what is in my hands is to remain free person, even in gulag. And I uh, found a lot of tricks and write about it in my book, how to remind myself that I'm a free person and they, are, uh, and they in fact, are not free. Here to the people who are sitting now and counting days when finally we can finish this, when we'll start go traveling freely all over the world, I tell them, look, it doesn't depend on you at this moment. So don't build your uh, plans depending on when you'll be ready to get out. But what depends on you, you can decide to, to plan that now you'll, in the next month, you can study a new language. Or you can finally study Hebrew. Or you can read many books that you didn't have time to read. Pl plan uh, your life around things which depend on you. Make some tough challenges for yourself and stand them. And of course, never forget your sense of humor. Never forget to laugh. Thanks God there are millions of jokes in English, in Hebrew, in Russian, in many other languages uh, around our situation. So be, uh, never stop laughing on our situation. And the most important thing, of course, never forget that you're part of great people with great history, uh, that you, we together are marching through this history, and we have a lot of things still to do together. And that's a Zionist message, right? Zionism was about a passive people, a broken down people, an isolated people who ultimately took control and took control of what they could take control of and had a mission and had a sense of soldiering and purpose. And I think that's what we want to give to our young people, especially, but to every one of us on the call, the sense of Zionism as not the only way, not the best way, but our way and a way into understanding that we're truly never alone, which is the theme of our book. And that gets to you. You said you talked about the unity that we had. Shlachet ami, let my people go in this movement. But you talk about French communists and ultra orthodox working together. These days, we're so focused on how divided we are, how easily we can fight between left and right and religious and secular. We fight over the Kotel itself, we fight over uh, Palestinians, we can fight over anything. Is it really that much worse than it was, or do we have a sort of false nostalgia? And what can we learn from our fights? Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, I'm not afraid when we have fights. In fact, uh, people forget how many fights we had in struggle for Soviet jury, how many were, uh, organizations were competing with one another and criticizing one another and dismissing one another and distrusting one another. And, uh, uh, I have a lot of stories about it, and some of them we share with in our book. But at the same time, it was clear that in the end, the common denominator is that we are one family, that we have one past, and inevitably we'll have one future. And, and we have to work with this. Uh, and then, uh, so the fact that we are fighting is the proof that we are alive, very alive, very assertive, uh, very determined uh, people. When we start forgetting or dismissing the fact that we have common future, that, uh, that when they say, no, really, these uh, diaspora Jews, they're not part of us, they're not with us. Or when the diaspora Jews say, oh, look, Israel is not home for everybody, they don't understand uh, uh, our way of uh, our path to Judaism, they don't accept it. It's not really our country. That's when uh, the danger is. This uh, not feeling that you disagree with me, but the feeling that you're betraying our mutual future, and now you're not part of this future, that's very dangerous. And against this, we have to 
to fight all the time, and there is no better way to fight but to argue with one another, and then and during this argument to remind one another, and first of all to ourselves, that uh, we have one aim and one future. So we have unity without uniformity, and we continue the dialogue because we are never alone and we're part of one uh, people. So you spend nine years in the Gulag, uh, the excitement around your release, uh, you walk across the tarmac and the KGB says walk straight and you, of course, zigzag in your final act of defiance. You meet Avital and you say, pardon me, I was late. Uh, pardon me for delaying, for being late. And um, you're in Israel. Tell us your first impressions of being in Israel. And secondly, tell us also, after a couple of years, especially once you enter politics, you're not always as popular as you were when you were alone in the gulag. How did you handle that? How do you, how, how did, it must be very difficult. I know George Washington had the same problem. There was a national holiday for him for winning the Revolutionary War before he became president. And once you go into politics, all of a sudden, you're not as popular because you're making decisions that sometimes are controversial. Was it disappointing? Was it frustrating? Well, first of all, uh, uh, I have to say that the, my first impression from Israel is not very different from my today's impression from Israel. Because I had this unique experience of going in one day straight from hell to paradise, from a Soviet prison through Germany, meeting my wife of 12 years, landing in the Ben Gurion airport, meeting our government and my people, and going straight to the Kotel and finishing it with all our people celebrating the Kotel. The feeling was very clear. You are in the paradise. And now, what, 30, uh, 33 years after this, when you are in the parad uh, the skies, you can only go down. So it's slowly, slowly going to the earth. I still feel with every day that we are here in paradise with a lot of problems. But you know, when we we'll go to the next world, we'll find out there are a lot of problems with a lot of battles, with a lot of challenges, with a lot of things to fix and so but it's so enjoying. I enjoy every moment of life with my people with, in my country. So it's for me even difficult to to say how different is Israel of uh, of my first days and and of today. It's much more realistic. It's much more in details. It's uh, it's much more specific. But it's. Uh, the same, this feeling of this unique connection with the history, with the past, with the people, with, with, uh, with our dreams, uh, that's, this, uh, this feeling is always uh, with me and try, I'm trying, we are, we at Vitalian Diana are trying to share it with our children, and with our grandchildren. As to these so-called disappointments, look, well, uh, the moment I came to Israel, and so many people told me, but we were fighting for you. You have to be with us. And people with very different agendas, and with very different political agendas, very different uh, religious agendas. So you understand very quickly that all the Jewish people were in this struggle. Uh, if, if you will be with everybody, you'll be with nobody. So you have to be yourself. You have to be uh, true to those th things which you discovered and which you believed and to follow them. Uh, and I didn't want to go to politics, but uh, I, I did con want to continue our struggle for the release of Soviet Jewry. And then when one million Jews came, it became clear that we have also to, to fight for their inter better integration. It, at some moment, it became clear that for this, you need to also to have some political tools. That's how I went to politics. But exactly as, as easily as I entered the politics, I also, the moment I felt that uh, this mission of integration of this big idea is fulfilled, it was not a problem for me to leave the politics because positions which you take are not really important when the highest, it so happened that the highest position in my life 
the biggest job which I had was my first job, being prisoner of Zion. You cannot be higher than this. It was so, such a uh, so, uh, all-consuming work and position. You, you know that you're connected with all the world. You're connected directly to Kadosh Baruch Hu. You're saying no KBG, to KGB, you're fulfilling all Tariag Mitzvot. So it was uh, really very important uh, role which uh, I had the honor of uh, playing uh, in the beginning of my professional career. So all the rest, all the other positions were only addition to this. And uh, uh, there was no other question whether the result, uh, I'll be more popular with some people or with others. Because I really wanted to remain connected to all the Jewish people through those ideas, through all those things which I discovered uh, in, in the, my years of struggle and which stayed with me. So, but it, you know, it, it still doesn't make sense to me. We have lots of good inside stories in the book about Israeli politics. But you, you're, Bibi Netanyahu is elected. He says to you, you can be my ambassador to the UN. You could be um, in my cabinet. You could be uh, uh, ambassador to the United States. And you say, no, I want to be the head of the Jewish agency. What's wrong with you? What were you thinking? Well, I, I'll do, want to remind you what I said to, then to Bibi. I said to Bibi, look, I was in four Israeli governments, and I resigned twice. For comparison, I was in four prisons, and I never resigned. And I could resign. I could uh, sign what KGB demands and be released. So uh, maybe politics is not for me. Maybe to, again, to go to, to the government and to think again and again uh, when to resign. And uh, then Bibi really became almost irritated. Or, so, said, but you don't want to be involved in public life anymore? He said, no, I do want to. Uh, just now the position of the head of Jewish agency is free. Uh, under the regulations of Jewish agency, it's of course board of governors of Chilex, but it needs agreement of prime minister. If you support my candidacy, I'm interested. And here they were surprised because usually the head of Jewish agency wants to be minister or the ambassador. And, uh, and then he asked, why? I, do you really think maybe, and he said with some sarcasm, that there will be another million Jews that you can bring? He said, I don't know, I'm not sure. But I do believe, Bibi, that you are right by concentrating on the most important task, uh, confronting Iran. Those who know that, in fact, Bibi from his first days, the politics felt that uh, the most important challenge that he has as the prime minister to face. I said, you are absolutely right. I agree with you. But we as Jewish people have another challenge, inner challenge. How we stay as one people, Israel and uh, Jews of the world. And uh, uh, that's exactly the thing with the, which I was dealing all my life. It doesn't matter in what capacity it was. And from my experience, from my experience of working with Jewish agency and fighting or resisting to Jewish agency, I do know what a big potential, what a unique place this organization can have between Israel and Jewish people in trying to bring them together. And that's something that really interests me. And uh, he, he said, okay. He supported my candidacy, I was elected. And really, I will have to say, next nine years in the, in the Jewish agency, which I spent, I couldn't spend more because that is my limit everywhere, in prison, in the government, now in Jewish agency. But that was, they were much less controversial for me because it does matter, there were many difficulties, of course, and financial difficulties, bureaucratic difficulties, everybody who knows how many different bosses are in Jewish agency can understand how difficult it is to run this organization. But the topics were so non-controversial. The idealism of everybody working in Jewish agency was so high. And it, whether you're dealing with Aliyah, whether you're dealing with Israeli engagement, whether you're dealing with Shlichim, our great Shlichim, to, uh, to universities, to the communities, to 
your small ones. I'm really very glad that I had the honor of strengthening and developing all these tools and uh, making them bigger and more powerful. Well, Natan, that's actually a perfect place uh, to end. I, I want to thank you not only for uh, this uh, interview, but um, also I want to thank you for all that you've done for the Jewish people, for me personally, and, um, and, and, and for showing us a path to building identity. And I think, my friends, as Natan says goodbye, um, that's our no, I want, Yeah, go. I only want to thank everybody from my beloved secret women's organizations who is doing such a good work of promoting Jewish power. So uh, as my first encounter with Hadassah, uh, until the, today's day, I really believe that you are very important and very powerful organization in our Zionist life. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So, and, and this is the homework part. You know, I'm a professor, so I can't finish without giving you, uh, all of you, and the hundreds of thousands of uh, amazing women and heroines you represent, and as I said, family members, homework. The homework is to carry the torch. The homework, you see how his Zionism is so ingrained. It's activism. It's a sense of purpose. It's a sense of pride. It's that balance between identity and freedom. We talk in the book about tensions, right? Not only tensions between left and right and religious and non-religious, but within your own identity, within your own moments, you're sometimes having a decision, how do I do it? We're not gonna always get it right, but we're part of one big story. And I think that sense that Natan gave us of you can be totally cut off, but you know you're never alone. You can be totally frustrated, but you see the bigger picture. And you can be, as we're all experiencing, isolated, uncertain, worried, but focus on what you can do. And one of the things we can do is we can continue to help with the extraordinary angels of mercy uh, of the Das Medical Organization. You want to talk about uh, what I call the Walmart of Israel, because at Hadassah, as in Walmart in the South, where Walmart was one of the few places when I traveled through the South, I found blacks and whites working together. At Hadassah Hospital, you find ultra-Orthodox and Orthodox and secular and Arabs working together and, uh, and, and in the, really the Republic of Humanity. And that's why so many years ago, I, I nominated Hadassah uh, Medical Organization for a Nobel Peace Prize, which is most deserved. And in this crazy world, of course, uh, will perhaps never be, um, never be awarded. But I give you... Uh, the prize for your nobility. And um, I think you've seen Natan's nobility. Uh, you can see what a pleasure it is to work with him, to learn from him. And um, you all have a responsibility. One of his frustrations, by the way, I didn't want to go into it, is that he wanders around and I'm seeing so many people with memories in the chat about what they did for Soviet Jewry. Have you told your kids about it? Have you told your grandkids about it? And have you all created a multi-generational conversation about the heroism that you did? And the heroism now you're continuing in supporting the Hadassah Medical Organization, in supporting a vibrant, vibrant, vital Jewish organization, Jewish community. And that is really the payoff. The payoff is when you give so much, you get so much, and you know that we're never alone. So thank you all, and thank you, Judy, and, um, for, for, for hosting this. And thank you, uh, Madam President, um, for... Um, for the invitation and uh i hope we continue the conversation but next time in person yeah. and let us say oh. amen oh, first, I'd like, first gil as the national president i also want to thank you and tell you that everyone who was on this webinar today is so appreciative for all that you do and for having you as such a close friend of Adassa. and we as zionists and jewish women who are the women with the power to do we will continue to do what we need to do we know our homework is never complete we will stand together for the jewish people and for israel thank you so much We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD.
Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.